My parents had just finished building our new house in Baghdad and took my brother and me, we were seven and three years old, on some vacation. They had finally overcome a difficult time in their lives. Five years in which my father had to serve the military in the Iraq-Iran war. This was finally all over. But fast forward a few months brings the next big shock. Iraq is heading into war with Kuwait. For my father, this meant serving the military again, seeing war again. For my mother, it meant raising the two of us on her own again. And then all of a sudden, one night, there he was, my father, standing on the porch, knocking the door of our house. My mother was in shock. He said, I fled. We have to leave now. The punishment for escaping the military would have been nothing less than the death sentence. They left the same night. They left everything behind, their new house, their belongings, their relatives and loved ones, even their university degrees. Our journey brought us to Austria, where my uncle was living. All the pain, the fear, the worries that my parents carried, I was lucky that at the age of four, I was too young to feel them. So there I was, and all I ever knew was Austria. It became my home. I entered kindergarten without a word of German, but luckily, small kids are not judgmental. We didn't even notice we weren't speaking a common language, so I learned German easily through kindergarten. It became my first language. I started reading at the age of five. My father taught me how to, and soon I'd be reading books to my fellow playmates in kindergarten. I loved reading so much that in elementary school, our local librarian told me that soon I would have finished all the books he had for my age group. And I did. But it wasn't only the language. Austria felt like home, my friends were there. I didn't know Iraq, I had never been there. The first time I felt different was on my first day in high school when I was 10 years old. A classmate referred to me as the black girl. I was irritated because there was another kid in our class who was as dark as I was, but he had a German name and no one called him black. When I was 14, I realized two things. That I wanted to become a mathematician, and that I wanted to wear the headscarf. The headscarf just felt right. I wanted to do it. I knew that there would be mixed reactions at school, and I felt I was prepared for that. But to my surprise, even my parents were against it. My mother wears the hijab herself, and still, or maybe because of that, they tried to convince me to wait. They were worried. And as it turned out later, they had good reason to be. But I felt it would be wrong not to do what I felt was right. So I had, on the one hand, to convince my parents, and on the other hand, also, convince everyone else that it was my own decision. From that moment on, a lot changed. All of a sudden, I no longer was that textbook example of a well-integrated immigrant child. While not much had changed inside of me, to my surrounding, I was a different person. From that day on, I would always be labeled as the Muslim girl, or the girl with a headscarf. And while I felt as Austrian as ever before, I would always get the same question when making a new acquaintance. Where are you from? Well, I'm from Puking, a small town near Linz, would be my natural answer. No, I mean, where are you from originally? Day in and day out, the same question. 
We human beings label and think in stereotypes. We have to label all the time. It's how our brain manages to function efficiently. It's a well-trained, amazingly functioning machine. When we see a cat, we think cat. When we see a boat, we think boat. When we see a staircase, our brain immediately recognizes it as such and knows exactly how the brain needs to operate. Imagine it would question whether it truly was a staircase. This would be highly inefficient. So we must think in labels. Labels that our brain is so good at giving because it has been trained since childhood. Nowadays, we want machines to become intelligent, and we train them, for example, on the task of recognizing objects and images. And it is truly astonishing how well these systems work. As an applied mathematician, I recently got interested in understanding why these deep neural networks work so well, because they aren't fully understood mathematically yet. In particular, I try to find out when these deep neural networks fail. So what we do is we take an image with an object that the algorithm can clearly recognize. For example, we take an image of a cat, and the algorithm knows there is a cat in this image. And then we slightly perturb this image. The change made is so small that to our human eyes, there's hardly a difference, but the algorithm can no longer recognize a cat in the image. These so-called adversarial examples are intentionally and specifically constructed so that we can understand why these wor networks work so well and when they fail. Our brain is so used to labeling that these labels inevitably come up when we see other humans as well, consciously or unconsciously. Our brain has so much data to draw from that it immediately adds a label when seeing another human being. When we see this picture, we think Asian. And when we see this picture, we think African. And for this one, probably Arabic. Our brain stereotypes all the time. What if, however, we were told that the Asian-looking person was, in fact, American? And the African-looking person was, in fact, French? And the Arabic-looking person was, in fact, German? When this happens, we tend to get uncomfortable. We add an explanation to it. German with migration background. I say this because I grew up being the Austrian with migration background. And this additional label, which sounds like we're in a supermarket trying to point out non-local vegetables, sends a message. To me, it always meant Austrian, but not quite. And this additional labeling doesn't stop with the kids of immigrants. Nowadays, we speak of the second and even third generation of immigrants. When do we stop counting? Today, I'm a math professor at ETH Zurich, so my daughter happens to grow up becoming a Swiss. Imagine if she was asked where she was from originally. She'd have to pull out a chart to explain it. I grew up learning that my parents weren't wrong with their fears. For example, that one time when I was alone, sitting in a train cabin, and a couple came to sit in front of me. The man started insulting me. He told me to go back where I came from, and that he was voting for the right-wing party so that people like me would soon be gone. When I tried leaving the train cabin, he even hit me. We must fight the conscious or unconscious bias that is in us, that accompanies us. It poisons our society. Or, as a Holocaust survivor once said, it brings out the worst versions of us. Stereotypes can lead to hatred, and hatred can lead to violence. Let's not label other people. Let's not judge them by the way they look or their heritage. Maybe we should approach each other like we were books, whose covers might not match the content. I once ordered a mathematical book on scattering theory. And when I received the book, the cover said, scattering theory, perfect. When I flicked through the pages, I was irritated because I couldn't see any mathematical formulas in it. So, on a closer inspection, I realized that the book was actually on something completely else, the inside of the book. It was a book on the African Union and new strategies for development in Africa. 
I literally learned to never judge a book by its cover. <laughs> During my studies in mathematics, I once worked on a research project for Pixar Animation Studios in Los Angeles. And after the project, I took a vacation to San Diego for a few days. In a shop in San Diego, a lady approached me and started chatting with me. And then she asked me where I came from. I stopped for a second, I wanted to say Austria, but then for no particular reason, I wanted to try an experiment, and I just said to her, I'm from LA. And the lady smiled at me and said, nice, I love LA. These words were transforming for me. My whole life in Austria, I tried to explain that I felt home there, and all of a sudden, there was this American lady who embraced that I would be American, although I wasn't. She didn't question my answer. But I grew up being questioned, whether I was a real Austrian, whether I wore the headscarf out of free will. It felt like being patronized all the time. And then there she was, this beautiful lady with her very simple gesture. To me, her words meant, be who you want to be. Define yourself. We should all have the right to define ourselves and to not be questioned for it. Being questioned all the time is a way to be kept busy with self-explanation. Instead, let's overcome this step and let everyone be who they aspire to be. Accept each other for who we are. If you want to understand someone, talk to them. Instead of speaking about minorities, speak with them, let them have a voice. View them as a possible enrichment to our society. Like Steve Jobs, who actually was the son of a Syrian immigrant. How do we want to deal with the next generation? Can we make them feel belong, no matter where their grandparents were born? The first step would be to stop using labels on each other. I'm a Muslim woman, but I'm also Austrian. I'm a mathematician, I'm a mother. When it comes to us human beings, we're all, in some sense, adversarial examples. Because a single label can never describe a complex human being. Thank you. <laughs>